Is Dr. Zepp from Cockrum working at NASA? Well, apparently he should be. On April 5th, 2063, Star Trek's fictional character, Dr. Zepp from Cockrum, was the first human to travel faster than the speed of light. Maybe Star Trek's discovery of warp speed technology is closer than we think. Is that Earth? That's it. It's so small. It's about to get a whole lot bigger. Harold Sunny White, the director of advanced research and development at the Limitless Space Institute, joins me to discuss everything warp technology. Join us as we get rebelliously curious. Sunny, thank you for joining me on Rebelliously Curious. So for the past year now, I've been following vicariously, and I've said this to you before, before our interview, Christopher Plain's article on warp drive technology, and you have been the center and focus of those articles, which is amazing. And they've done really well at the debrief. Uh, thanks for so, asking me on the show, Chrissy. Good to, good to see you today. So. Good to see you as well. So I will start off with it that you have 25 years of experience working in the aerospace industry. You've worked for Boeing, Lockheed Martin, NASA, and now you are, I believe, the Director of Advanced Research and Development at Lim Limitless Space Institute. Yep. Can you tell us, just in the beginning, what Limitless Space Institute is and then what your mission is there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Limitless Space Institute, uh, we are a nonprofit uh, registered 501c3. Um, our mission is to inspire and educate the next generation to travel beyond our solar system uh, and to support the research and development of enabling technologies. Uh, our, our pinnacle objective, if you will, is to work to try and enable interstellar travel by the end of the century. And that's that's an unbelievably you know, difficult objective. And, and oftentimes when I, when I do talk to people about uh, this, this area of interest, if you will, uh, I try and make sure they understand how difficult it really is and how, how far beyond some of the things we typically think of uh, when we think of space exploration, doing something like this really is. Like when we, when we think of space exploration today, you know, we've got this mental picture of uh, some of the great rockets that fly uh, human beings to low Earth orbit. Uh, uh, there's some neat stuff going on with uh, SpaceX with an even bigger rocket that they're trying to do and maybe even send human beings to Mars one day, right, as, as amazing as that would seem. Uh, we've got uh, rovers that are on the surface of Mars that send back a, a lot of neat pictures and so forth. Um, and, and all that was done with chemical propulsion, right? So that's when you have a, a fuel and an oxidizer and you combine those folks with, uh, uh, in such a way so that they burn and you get a rocket that lifts and makes a, a lot of noise. Uh, but if we, if we wanna send a human being to Saturn and we wanna get them to Saturn in 200 days, um, that requires an order of magnitude more energy than it takes to get a payload from the surface of the earth to low earth orbit. So all that to say, chemical propulsion can't close that, right? It's just not physically possible. The performance that you get out of chemical propulsion can't do that. So, well, is all hope lost, right? Did I just basically, you know, say that the mission is not possible? Uh, no, it, it's not impossible. There are things that we can do to potentially help us uh, address this, this perennial time distance problem about uh, going to the outer solar system and, and onto the stars one day. Um, and so, you know, there's, we just recently put out a video, uh, a short film on our YouTube channel called Go Incredibly Fast, kind of highlights some of this stuff at a, at a much higher level. The universe has shown us that this can be done by altering the scale of space itself. And we are working to develop new understandings of physics to learn how this might be controlled. If we could construct a starship with a propulsion system that decreases space in front of it and expands space behind it, this ship could cross enormous distances effectively faster than the speed of light. Such a ship would reach from Mars to Saturn in just a matter of minutes and be able to reach Proxima Centauri in less than six months. Um, but 
but uh, some of the ways that we, we think about things in terms of pushing humans further out, um, nuclear electric propulsion, that's a, a nuclear reactor coupled to some form of electric propulsion. Uh, that kind of a power propulsion architecture uh, can basically take humans everywhere in the solar system, right? And that's known physics, known engineering. We, we understand both of those concepts. Um, but that can't do interstellar, right? If you wanted to do interstellar with nuclear, you're still talking thousands of years. Um, uh, chemical propulsion is like tens of thousands of years. Um, so nuclear electric propulsion would give us a solar system, but it doesn't really give us practical interstellar. Uh, if we wanted to do interstellar with a large payload, then you're probably going to have to move a little bit into the unknown, uh, at least in the context of uh, uh, engineering. Uh, but within known physics and, and talk about things like fusion propulsion. So that's like the sun works with, with fusion. And maybe in the next 10 years, we'll actually have terrestrial fusion power reactors. Uh, but fusion as a propulsion scheme uh, can allow us to send large payloads to other star systems in about 100 years, maybe a little less. Um, but you know that at least moves that into to that zip code. So a big improvement over millennia. But uh, if we want to do interstellar in a, a fraction of a, a human lifetime, we probably need to look to the frontiers of physics. Uh, if you think about physics, the, the totality of physics as we know it today, as a Venn diagram, you got two circles that are on this Venn diagram. You've got, uh, uh, in one circle, you've got the words quantum mechanics, and in another circle, you've got the words general relativity, those two circles touch. Um, and so that kind of covers what we know from the microscopic to the macroscopic. Uh, and, you know, just that knowledge of physics, we use it every day in, right. in form of a, you know, a cell phone and global positioning satellite to chips on the, on, the, on the cell phone. But because those two theories are not compatible, we know there's a more generalized understanding that we have yet to figure out. So, um, you know, the idea of a space warp or a wormhole, those are two interesting loopholes that come from general relativity uh, that might allow us to do rapid uh, interstellar. Um, but we can't specifically say, what do we build to go make the USS Enterprise from the, the TV show Star Trek? We, we don't know how to do that yet. And so that's where we maybe need to also look at the frontiers of physics. So a kind of a long-winded answer, but I think it's kind of necessary to, to tee things up properly. That's LSI, that's our mission. And those are some of the things that we think about when we get up in the morning and come to work. That was fabulous. You just answered, you answered majority of the questions that I had about, oh, right. Well, we'll right. So you're like, we're done now. So we can, we're, we can we're, move on. As the, as the movie title is, we're going incredibly fast. Right. Through this right exactly. No, I, I think that was fabulous. It was a great summary when we're looking at warp technology. Mm -hmm. So can you explain then the difference of, because, right, I was going to ask you a question about general relativity with Einstein's theory, because Einstein believed that uh, wormholes were, that were real, and we were able mm -hmm. to use that. So how is warp drive technology, and then the theory of relativity, how are they similar and different? And then how are you using the concept of warp holes in your own technology and propulsion systems <clears throat> that you're creating now? So, you know, general relativity uh, is an, an unbelievably successful theory. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's beautiful in terms of the mathematic framework. Uh, it, was, it predicts a lot of things that we struggled for years to predict, the perihelion advance of uh, Mercury, uh, the bending of starlight. Um, you know, it, uh, uh, it, technically speaking, it's also the same mathematical framework that establishes the, uh, the cosmological <clears throat> speed limit in the in the in the, co in the universe, right? Um, I call it the eleventh commandment of physics: Thou shalt not exceed uh, the speed of light, right. right? And so, technically speaking, that's the fastest that mass can go, right? Uh, of, of any kind, it's 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 a speed limit. But the same mathematical framework that establishes uh, uh, that cosmic speed limit also gives us a couple of uh, mathematical uh, loopholes, if you will, mathematical models. Uh, that allow us to envision something that would allow us to see a scenario where an object can go from one point to another point. Uh, and it could be seen by you know, an external observer such that that occurs where it almost looks like it's faster than the speed of light. Technically, it's never faster than the speed of light. Nothing locally exceeds the speed of light, but it has the net effect of enabling rapid uh, 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 interstellar transit. And, and to be clear, Right. Sometimes people get confused about this. Um, this is this is not like relativistic uh, travel, where you get really close to the speed of light and the onboard clocks slow down. So it looks like to the crew on board the spacecraft that's going 0.999999C 
that time's going by so slowly for them that it looks like they're covering the universe in a, in a couple of weeks, if you will. Uh, but this is a bona fide scenario where the, the mathematics says you can have a situation, this is like a space warp to be explicit. You could have a situation where you have a spacecraft that implements a space warp, goes to Proxima Centauri and it gets there in uh, two weeks, right? You pick your time frame. it gets there in two weeks as measured by clocks on board the spacecraft and as measured by clocks back in mission control in, in Houston, right? And so that is uh, completely consistent mathematically in the context of general relativity, right? And so mm -hmm. uh, the idea of a space warp in a wormhole, right? These are mathematical uh, models that uh, come up, uh, come from the, the, the framework of general relativity. And so um, we know that they're mathematically possible. We just don't know how to physically make one per se, right? Uh, but I mean, remember black holes were, are, were predicted by general relativity as well, right? And so um, maybe it just remains to be determined for us to figure out if we can, we can engineer something that would manifest something like that, so. Yeah, and what would the ship look like then? What would a Starcraft look like if it was using warp technology? So the, uh, the model that I'll speak to is the Alcubierre model. Um, there's yeah. a, a model that was published by Miguel Alcubierre in 1994 uh, in General Relativity and Gravitation Journal, I believe. And uh, uh, he went through and created a little toy model uh, that went through and said, all right, if this is something that's possible, uh, what do I need to, you know, how do I build the metrics so that it uh, allows me to do something like this? So when you look at the, uh, the field equations for the model, it ends up with a situation where you have a spacecraft that has uh, some kind of an external ring in an annular shape uh, with some central portion. Let's just assume that it's shaped like a football, if you will. So you got a central football that's connected to a, an outer ring through some pylon supports or whatever. Uh, and the, the football and the ring travel uh, along the, the central axis of the football with the ring, uh, the, the, the plane of the ring uh, orthogonal to the velocity vector of the spacecraft. And so uh, for, for listeners that aren't familiar with it, you could Google IXS Enterprise. That's a, a good um, uh, concept that we developed back in 2011, 11, 12 timeframe as part of an education outreach uh, that shows how does the math and physics map to something physical. So in other words, what, what would a, a warp capable spacecraft really look like uh, if you were to do it based on the physics? So. Yeah, because it's it's unbelievable. And I looked up the Akubier and I read a little bit about where it originated from. And then I read some other articles when you were working at NASA, you were working on a white paper as well that you were submitting talking about warp technology. And that was just up online, I believe, through on the NASA's website. And then uh, that kind of disappeared. And then we saw a year later in 2021, and that was in 2020, I believe. And then in 2021, there was two other scientists that were submitting a patent on warp technology. And then that kind of now is still patent pending. Where are we now in this timeline of, of warp dive technology? And where are you guys currently? And where do you sit with that? Because it's, it's been a few years now. Yeah, so we're definitely more in the category of just trying to explore the basic science and how do you map that through some uh, experimental approaches in the laboratory to see if we can see uh, signatures from what the math and physics predicts. Uh, certainly nothing uh, uh, at all that would trace to um, uh, something that, that might be, where someone might be motivated to put into a patent, not even remotely close to uh, anything like that, at least not with the stuff that uh, either we're looking at or the people that, that we're close to that are that are working at or working on. Uh, you know, if, if somebody's got something, I, I wish them well. It'd be really neat if they could do that. Um, uh, but uh, we're we're at LSI and the folks that we're affiliated with, we're we're focused just on the science, if you will. Uh, and so we we published a paper um, uh, in uh, uh, EPJC. Uh, we were doing some work for DARPA at the time. Uh, with some custom casimir cavities, these very tiny little devices. If you imagine uh, like two, two little vertical plates, uh, turn to the camera, two little vertical plates that are very close to one another. And then we had uh, some pillars that we put uh, uh, between the plates. Uh, I'm not doing a very good job of hand puppets here, but you can probably look up some stuff online or before the paper. Uh, maybe you could put a link to it uh, with the video. Uh, but we were studying uh, some custom casimir cavities. We we're trying to figure out how the quantum vacuum behaves to the presence of these uh, arbitrary potentials in the form of the, the structures that we, we were building. 
And we noticed that the response of the quantum vacuum to the presence of the, the, the pillar that was in those cavity, we had like three pillars in the cavity. Uh, the response of the quantum vacuum to those pillars was such that when you take like a two dimensional section cut and look at the, what the mathematical models predict, the energy density, negative vacuum energy density distribution matches very closely to what the uh, Acubier equations require in terms of, you know, what do you need to make this trip possible? And so we, uh, uh, it was just a qualitative similar, similarity at the time. And so we, we went through and said, well, what can we do to make it a little bit more uh, exact what the Okubi warp requirement uh, has? And so instead of having two plates with a, uh, a central pillar that goes down through the center, which results in uh, prismatic shaped um, uh, lenticular type uh, distributions, uh, we looked at uh, having a, a one micron sphere uh, in the middle of a, a four micron cylinder. I'll use a hand puppet here. Um, so you've got uh, basically something like this, just a little one micron sphere inside of a four micron cylinder. Um, and the, the response of the quantum vacuum is such that the energy density distribution uh, that occurs in the vacuum around the, the central sphere, uh, that matches the requirements for the Alcubierre warp metric. Uh, and so that told us that uh, if we built something of that size, uh, it would manifest a, a negative vacuum energy density so that it is predicted to manifest a, a real uh, nanoscale warp bubble. Now, we, we said in the paper, nobody get excited. It's not zipping off and doing anything. It's just going to sit there on the, on, the, on, the, you know, on the laboratory shelf and just do nothing at all, right? Uh, but it might have some optical properties that might be interesting to see if we could explore and see if we can't see a signature of this thing that's predicted from the physics. So can we, and that's where the, the open work we identified in the paper was, can we, can we conceive of an experiment uh, that one could conduct where you could actually measure those optical changes in, in some way, right? So, um, that in, it, so in my mind, that's, that's kind of where it's at. Uh, you know, we've, we've been constantly working on things you know, since before 2009, right, all the way back uh, in the early 2000s, doing publishing papers on this stuff. Uh, so it's been a continual process, but that's where we're at. They still firmly in the realm of physics and science. Uh, nothing I, I would personally feel comfortable saying that we need to go into a, no patents or in my immediate future whatsoever. So. Right. And that's great. I'm glad for the care the clarification because the timeline is really interesting. And I even had Chris and I talked about it last night uh, before I did this interview with you a little bit about that timeline and where hopefully potentially we'll be going now. Where oh. do you see and, and, you know, just as a prediction right now, obviously you might not know how close are we to having something that would be a warp bubble around a craft? How far away from me are we from? I get, you know, Chrissy, I get that question a lot. That is a I can imagine. Question. And, yeah. and I get it. I, I, I get it. it. It's it's something that uh, you know. It, it, it's something very incredible to envision uh, in your head in terms of what what if type of thing. And, and so uh, people always want to know, you know, how close are we? When when the, when can I get my 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 reservation of a seat on board this thing? Right? Um, <clears throat> you know, I don't know if it's going to be you know, two years, twenty years. 200 years or, or, or 2000 years. Um, I, uh, I, I know what I need to be doing now, right? Uh, in terms, at least me personally and other people I think are focused on things that they need to be doing now. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll continue to, to work on things uh, to see, uh, see how far I can get um, in my, my, my limited time here. Um, you know, I, I, so let, me, let me qualify this answer with the following uh, comparison. So I taught some classes at International Space University last summer, and I got a chance to spend some time uh, at a cathedral there in Strasbourg, uh, called the Strasbourg Cathedral. And uh, absolutely amazing construction. It's uh, very emotional to kind of see the size and stature, but when you come up onto it, you walk down through some, some narrow little pathways next to some French bakeries, and it's all very charming. Then you walk into this open courtyard, and you stare up, and there's this huge, magnificent uh, cathedral. Uh, but the interesting thing about the cathedral is they started building that cathedral in like 1100 AD, right? And they didn't finish it until the 1700s. Uh, so the people that built the basement had no hope of seeing the final product, um, but they had to do their part uh, for the next generation 
to do their part. And that had to go on and go on and go on and go on. And so each generation kind of had the only, the only thing they could do was envision in their head what it might look like uh, one day. And so I think in a day and an age when we get really impatient when somebody doesn't text us back, you know, hello, right? You know, we've probably all sent that text. Um, uh, in, in a day and age, I think it's important for us to remember that not only is it important to work together in the here and now, we also have to work together across across time, right? And so, um, you know, maybe this could be a long game. Uh, uh, conversely, I'm, I'm, I'm going to flip total total span of, of time frame here for a second. <clears throat> you know, the, if you think about the frontiers of physics that I just talked about, the Venn diagram, quantum mechanics, general relativity, as we work to try and understand this more general framework, we're going to come up with new new mathematics, new physics models, and so forth. Um, and what, what will be the next E equals MC squared as we do that? And, and think about that. E equals MC squared, uh, you know, 1905, derived, published 1905. Um, 1932, split the first atom. Uh, you know, in the 1940s, they had the, the first nuclear reactor. And of course, 19... 45, you had the Trinity test, uh, not exactly the, the best poster child for, for the development of an idea. But, but what I'm trying to draw from this is we go from a simple equation to this, to the most energetic phenomena uh, uh, ever explored by humanity in a short span. And that's completely without computers, right? Completely without machine learning, completely without artificial intelligence. And so, you know, what, what kind of exponential increase in growth could we potentially see now that we have these additional uh, capabilities at our disposal so that when we, in the process of working on the, the frontiers of, of physics, uh, what if we find some new equation that's this E equals MC squared equation that traces directly to what's necessary to make the idea of a, a space warp work. And so, you know, it, it, maybe it'll be much faster than we ever thought. Maybe it'll be never, right? I, I, you get what I'm saying. I'm trying to describe the different perspectives. And I think there's, there's value in, in artic articulating each additional perspective of things. So that was, the, that was the best non-answer I could give you. Right? So. I respect that. I, I no, I think it was a great response because it's true. We have to look at all different angles and all different perspectives and obviously know that over time that we do have to work together because science isn't done in a day and technology isn't built in a day. It's built with groups of peoples and companies. With that said, are you working now with somebody like, are you working maybe again with NASA? Are you, I imagine you're working with tons of different institutes as well. Are you working potentially maybe with SpaceX or Blue Origin? Have you looked at partnering with them or collaborating on any other propulsion systems that you might be working on along with that warp drive technology? So in, in terms of uh, uh, external entities that we're working with, you know, we've been doing this for two years. Uh, we've signed formal agreements with well over uh, 21 different organizations all over the globe. Uh, we have um, a number of programs that we, we pursue that kind of map to that to mission statement you've heard me talk about. Um, you know, we've, uh, <clears throat> we have something called LSI grants. Uh, so we did a, a grant cycle in 2020 to 2022 timeframe. Uh, we put out nine grant awards and we funded teams that work on things like uh, beam energy propulsion, uh, relativistic solar sails. We did four teams that did the fusion propulsion, two working on space drives, and then we did one working on uh, traversable wormholes. Uh, that span universities like the University of Santa Barbara, MIT, Caltech, University of Maryland, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, um, uh, Delft University of Technology, uh, Technion Israel Institute of Technology. I could go on, uh, uh, but we, you know, we finished a two-year cycle of, of grants there. Um, we did that in partnership with Texas A&M uh, and Breakthrough Initiatives. Um, just last Friday, uh, we also released another solicitation. Uh, for a second round of grants. So we uh, were asking for proposals from universities all over the globe uh, with our 2022 to 2024 LSI grants program. Uh, we are also expanding the, the, the proposal, sorry, the, the program to include graduate fellowships and graduate postdocs. So these are two-year awards where we'll fund students for two years worth of work uh, at a, a host uh, university. Uh, we do university partnerships. We're currently funding Texas A&M right now to do some 
uh, a detailed uh, detailed design slash white paper study uh, looking at portable nuclear reactors. Uh, this is predominantly for terrestrial use. And so there's, there's a reason behind this process and I'll explain it in 90 seconds or less. Um, the, the Department of Defense has a solicitation out for something called Project Pele. Uh, and that is they're trying to establish a capability where they have portable nuclear reactors that are one to 10 megawatt electric uh, power level uh, and they can fit in a 40 foot, 40 foot connex container and they can be moved around the globe to secure locations to provide power for a growing electrified fleet. The Department of Defense is continuing to embrace uh, electrical capability just like everybody else. And so that uh, reactor uh, uh, design that the Department of Defense is, is looking to build uh, and demonstrate, I think they're gonna announce a winner here uh, for the solicitation probably in the next few weeks. And they'll build a demo plant at Idaho National Labs. Uh, we wanted to take the solicitation and add a few requirements such that the design that meets all those project paleo requirements is also capable of being adapted for use in space, right? Uh, uh, if you remember my, when I kind of talked about the three swim lanes of ways we can try and uh, address the time distance problem, nuclear electric propulsion was that first swim lane, right? So nuclear reactors coupled to electric propulsion. And so if you have nuclear electric propulsion with humans involved, you're talking megawatt electric type power levels. And so this is an interesting opportunity where maybe we can uh, talk to DOD stakeholders and talk to you know, members of Congress to say, if you write future solicitations so that, that they include just a few additional shall statements, you can make all that design development testing and engineering monies so that they have a product that's 70% compatible for future adaptation uh, in, in use in space. Uh, so, uh, another program uh, is university partnerships. Uh, and then we have um, scholarships for undergraduates. We have LSI lab boosters. Uh, where we cover you know, K through 12. We've got a couple of those out right now. Uh, and we teach summer courses. So a lot of activity, a lot of partners, um, uh, always looking to have discussions with anyone that wants to partner with us on that kind of stuff in the future. So you mentioned a couple, we're happy to talk to them if they wanna come in and, and help us extend these programs, so. That's great. That's a great, such great responses. With the Department of the DOD that you've mentioned, have you worked with the Department of Energy as well? Have you spoken to them? Yeah. Uh, so the Department of Energy, I think, uh, you know, they've, they've been interested in trying to think about fusion a little bit more. Uh, obviously, this is all in the context of terrestrial. Uh, and I think that's extremely important. Uh, in, the, in the interest of kind of following a crawl, walk, run type of mentality, uh, you know, it's very likely we'll see fusion on the ground long before we, we see it in orbit. There's one or two dark horses that make me wonder, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but the Department of Energy had some specific uh, uh, meetings that they wanted to host. And so they invited us and several other folks uh, to those meetings just to kind of talk about the state of things and how they map some of the different things we, we'd like to see. So I know the Department of Energy is interested in that. Uh, and I believe they've they may be actually working closely with a, an organization called Commonwealth Fusion. Um, this, is, this is a commercial spinoff from uh, uh, MIT, uh, an organization that uh, is trying to build a, a, a demonstration plant, demonstration fusion plant that uses magnetic confinement uh, fusion. Um, they're looking to get a physics coefficient of performance of somewhere between five and 10. Uh, and so that means it's, uh, you know, heat in versus heat out, which is why I use the word physics coefficient of performance as opposed to engineering coefficient of performance. Uh, and they're looking to do that in the 2025 timeframe. Uh, and uh, I believe they even, they just finished a very large series B. Uh, and so that's an interesting organization the Department of Ener Energy is interested in. Uh, General Fusion is another commercial company, uh, Canadian company. Um, I think they have a contract uh, to build a, physic, uh, a demonstration, you know, a physics demonstration plant over in the UK, slightly different approach. I think that's magnetic inertial confinement. I think I got that right. Uh, slightly different approach, but, um, uh, and then there's uh, Tokamak Energy over in the UK. They have a, a very interesting and promising approach, Tri-Alpha Energy. Um, so, you know, the, the Department of Energy is following all these organizations. It's, uh, I think, keenly 
interested to see how those things progress. Uh, there's been a, a big change in fusion uh, in the last 10 years, right? That's kind of, I think, moved it more near term than anyone really thought. Right. And you mentioned the, the one of the key words of commercial. We know that space tourism is going to be part of, uh, you know, the commercial industry in 2025. I believe they said the first space tourism hotel will be active. Are you looking to gear the company in or work with people within space tourism as well with warp drive or again, any other technology that might be happening in space? You know, uh, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, Hmm. I'm going to have to just answer that one off, uh, off the cuff. Um, hadn't thought explicitly about things that way. Um, we tend to work on stuff that's uh, so far down in the TRL. Uh, it, it was not obviously immediate uh, things that, that pop into mind uh, in terms of commercial. Now, maybe, uh, so here, here's a way we could potentially uh, map to some of the things you're talking about. Maybe it's a scenario where we could have some opportunities where promising ideas are far enough uh, up the, the, the TRL level. Uh, think like, you know, for example, beamed energy propulsion. Uh, we funded a team that did uh, beamed energy propulsion. Uh, maybe we could find a scenario where it would be interesting to see if we couldn't host some kind of on-orbit demonstration, very early on-orbit demonstration of a concept with one of the commercial uh, entities that are out there. Um, you know, for example, clips, like something going to the moon. Maybe that can provide an opportunity where uh, we could have a small payload that was part of that mission, uh, and we're just going to do some kind of a, a, a simple test of a concept or something like that, where it's not a money-making type of thing, but it's taking advantage of the cost uh, uh, benefits of using uh, commercial capabilities, if you will, right? So it, it, maybe, that's the, maybe that's the answer. The, the, the commercial entities that are out there may provide for more frequent and uh, less expensive opportunities to do tests of things on orbit. There you go. That's the answer. Right. No, that's great. And traveling so fast or traveling just as close to the speed of light is <laughs> insanely, well, as we know, humans can't because they'd be ripped apart in that. Can you explain then how humans would be able to travel them within that craft at just at the speed of light? Because I believe that we, we can't travel at the speed of light, but we can just travel just below it. So the, a great question uh, provides a great opportunity to kind of communicate uh, 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 some important ideas. Uh, so what you were speaking of, traveling just at the speed of light, that would be what I would call relativistic uh, travel, where you're, you're using some conventional propulsion approach to try and accelerate and accelerate and accelerate and accelerate until you're, you're closing in on the speed of light, and then you have all the relativistic issues. And technically speaking, there's, there's nothing that would tear you apart in that situation. I mean, unless you hit something, you hit something and forget it, right? You're just going to be- That would be scary. A white <laughs> speck in the night sky, right? Um, right. But uh, the, the the beauty of the idea of the space warp is that uh, it's got a, a, a couple of very uh, appealing characteristics, right? Uh, I, and I don't know if uh, Kubier intended this when he constructed the metric or not, but um, the idea of a space warp, right? You're, you're never going- really close to the speed of light. You're using a trick. It's a, it's a loophole in general relativity. So you're never locally exceeding the speed of light. Even though it might look like you're going 10C, you're never locally exceeding the speed of light. Um, uh, uh, so, that, so that's number one. Number two, the, if you look at the field equations for the Alcubierre warp metric, um, the, uh, <clears throat> the proper acceleration alpha inside of the bubble is zero. So it's zero G. So when you turn the warp bubble on and off, right, the crew doesn't get squished against the back bulkhead and, and kills everybody on board the Enterprise and makes for a sad short episode of Star Trek, um, right? It, it's zero G. So it's very, very benign, very appealing. Um, the uh, proper time is equal to coordinate time inside the warp, warp bubble. So dt is equal to d tau. It's a mathematical thing. Uh, and so that's uh, clocks are synchronized between mission control and the bridge. Um, and so the, the Akubia work metric has a lot of appealing characteristics that to make it, in my estimation, way more interesting uh, than relativistic travel from the standpoint you don't have all those additional uh, issues, right? So. Yeah, and I, I, interesting when you said like, and I, I never even thought of that, that you would be 
there's creating obviously something that you're not going to be smushed against the craft. Mm -hmm. So then if we're able to sit in the craft and it's going to take us, it would take us seconds, right? I believe to get from earth to um, Proxima Centauri, which I would honestly, like, I believe as you said, take seconds to get there. Have we ever then it, thought- So the, the, the well, just to, to um, embellish what you just said there, uh, how long does it take to Alpha Centauri? Well, it just depends upon how fast do you want to, if, what's your effective velocity? You want your effective velocity to be 10 C, then it would take, you know, 0.43 years to get there. Uh, if you want it to be 100 C, then it would be 0.043. I'm just kind of doing round math real quick. Um, if you could only do 1.5 C, right, then you're still going to take a few years to get there. Um, so the, the, the time it takes to get from your point of origin to your point of destination, what effective velocity do you want to try and achieve? You plug that into the field equations. How big is your spacecraft? Plug that into the equations, and that tells you what you need in the form of exotic matter or negative vacuum energy density to make that thing uh, physically manifest. Right. So then crypto sleep wouldn't be something that we would even look at, you know, using hibernation as a technique. Would we still even be considering that now with warp drive technology or is this, would that just become obsolete because we can travel fast enough to get somewhere in a year? You know, why would you have to take a long nap in a year? You could live. In a <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, why would you want to? Minutes. Right, 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 right. Um, yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think, you know, in some ways this highlights uh, uh, a lot of discussions I've had over the years uh, when I was still at the agency. Um, when you talk about uh, sending human beings to the outer solar system, uh, just, just in that discussion, uh, the power and propulsion system sets all the critical boundary constraints for all the other supporting subsystems, like life support. Okay, you want to send human beings to Saturn. Well, how long are you going to take to get there? Well, we'll take 10 years. Well, that means the life support systems has to be this, the power has, has to be this, the consumer. You have to have enough Twinkies for the people to eat from point A to point B, right? Uh, so those are all things that you would, would be impacted by whatever transit time you take, which is completely driven by power and propulsion systems. So, um, uh, it, it, like, and even when we look at how LSI is doing the grants, right, the LSI grants, uh, they are laser focused on power and propulsion because at the end of the day, all the other supporting subsystems of a spacecraft are um, all their performance characteristics are completely dictated by how long it takes to, to get from your starting point to your end point, which is all about the power and propulsion system. So, yes, I, you know, with those short transit times, you don't need cryosleep, right? So yeah, it's great. It solves that issue instantly for everybody. Um, or, you know, saying that you would be going e even deeper into deep space. It's something that you'd be able to have on board, but maybe not have to use. Um, hopefully not. There was some controversy around the M drive, which I believe is a thruster um, for a spacecraft. Can you break down what that controversy is? Because I believe that you guys came forward and said that this was actually possible um, as a type of propulsion. Yeah, so some of the stuff we worked on when I was back at NASA uh, was exploring uh, some, some physics ideas and how they might apply to that, uh, that tapered thruster that uh, people talk about uh, as the M drive. We were curious about exploring how some models we were working with at the time called the dynamic vacuum model might map to that physical implementation. Uh, and maybe it might provide a mechanism for one to be able to interact with the, the quantum vacuum or the fabric of space time, however you want to articulate that. Uh, and so we tried to go through and, and do a very rigorous uh, campaign using a, a, a low thrust torsion pendulum that we had in our labs at uh, NASA. It's actually just right across from the monitor here today. Uh, but we went through and studied you know, how that system behaved uh, in a, a high vacuum uh, environment under vibration isolation uh, and tested it for, you know, under a number of runs and then published a paper in the Journal of Propulsion and Power. Uh, and so at best, what we were able to see in terms of what we, what we measured was uh, a, a thrust to power of very, very low newtons per kilowatt, if you will, uh, not even competitive with the uh, hall thrusters uh, uh, per se. Uh, and we also had some false positives we, we were still worried about uh, that we highlighted in the paper. Uh, most notably, it was, it was thermal that we were, we were concerned about. Uh, and so I think that uh, definitely fed forward into some work that was done by Martin Kamar, uh, and some other folks at Naval Research Labs to try and go through and pull on that thermal thread, if you will, to see, uh, is there a mundane explanation uh, for this type of a, a concept? And so 
I think, you know, maybe the, the, the controversy might stem from the fact of, of, you know, what are you pushing off of, right? And so in, in our perspective, we were interacting with the field, like uh, we were conjecturing the, the quantum vacuum field. Uh, we were imparting momentum on that field and, and conserving momentum that way. Um, and so I think there's a couple other models that folks have built over the years for the idea of a space drive. And, and our, matter of fact, our, our last uh, LSI grants solicitation, or LSI grants award class, we had two teams that were working on the idea of a space drive. Um, one team from MIT working on how you might interact with the quantum vacuum and another one, uh, Technion Israel Institute of Technology uh, and the Unlab. Uh, we're doing some work on uh, how vacuum fluctuations might be able to generate a very small um, thrust signal. Uh, now we, <clears throat> we published a paper, uh, Ray Sedwick and I published a paper in the Journal of Spacecraft and Rockets that went through and said, what are the performance limitations for the idea of a space drive, just generically speaking, um, whether you push off of the quantum vacuum or this manifold of space time, whatever, whatever different uh, physics models people might be thinking about. We, we came up with about uh, seven different cases that kind of define what are the performance limitations for these types of concepts uh, such that they conserve momentum and they conserve energy. And so uh, there's a paper on uh, Journal of Spacecraft and Rockets. Uh, I think it's uh, all about uh, conservation laws. So I, I can send you a link to the paper. I would love uh, to that's, see that. That's something I think that was very valuable for the community to have. Because I know there's a lot of misconceptions. People talk about uh, uh, what violates conservation and momentum. Well, I mean, no, not, it, not if you're conjecturing there's a field that you're interacting with. Then the question is, what, what is the performance limitations in terms of the newtons per kilowatt? And that's a very, a very important thing to be thinking about right, in terms of how much delta B can you put into a spacecraft, right? So. Right. And you're working on all these different propulsion systems right now and technology and looking at deep space as using that technology there. What about on planet Earth? Are you going to be using that technology and warp drive? And you know, solar sails or anything. Well, solar sails wouldn't make sense in that, but warp drive technology on the planet is what kind of propulsion are you even looking at that? Because I would imagine that if we're going to use it for deep space, is there a possibility that we would maybe use it on Earth? And this might be my ignorance. No, no, I think that's a, that's a it's always a good question to explore, right? Uh, uh, I think is it Rocket Labs that has the, the we go to space to make life better here. I think that's their pet their pat phrase, right? But uh, right. Uh, maybe I need to give them a nickel now that I said that. <laughs> um, you know, it's a couple I think companies it's a, you need to. <laughs> right, 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 Some great right. shout outs, yeah. Right. I think, well, I, think um, I think it's important to figure out in the process of exploring these ideas, I mean, how does it benefit us, right? What, what's the value proposition? And so, right. uh, so let's talk about it a little bit more broadly than, than just the idea of a space warp, and, but I'll talk about that too. Be great. Um, so if we have... Uh, compact and safe forms of nuclear power, right? Uh, that helps with the concerns that we have about global warming. It helps us in our quest to minimize uh, how much carbon we put into the environment and maybe even helps us with carbon sequestration, how can we even pull it out? And so the, the same can be said for fusion power. If we have the ability to generate uh, power for the grid using uh, fusion reactors that come out of a lot of uh, work that's currently going on. I mean, that's that's going to be of immeasurable benefit for uh, humanity. Uh, and and you know when you when you think back to the three swim lanes that I talked about, uh, technically all three need massive amounts of power, and they need massive amounts of power that are very lightweight. So having lightweight, massive amounts of power, I mean that that always benefits humanity on the planet for a, a multitude uh, of reasons. Um, now, the idea of a space warp, um, the, so think about the paper that I talked about where we published something in EPJC about uh, making a, a small little nanoscale warp bubble. Uh, now, it, it's not going to go anywhere, but it's going to have optical properties, and it's uh, in effect going to be kind of a form of a broadband metamaterial, meaning it'll, it'll, it'll affect all wavelengths of light uh, <clears throat> uh, equally, if you will. Uh, and so, you know, maybe that could provide a lot of interesting things that people might want to explore from an optical perspective that have nothing to do at all with uh, space flight. Uh, but even let's, let's talk more specifically, though, about what if one could do an actual space warp bubble 
Does it have to go 10C to be useful? No. Right. right? If you had something that could go 0 0.000001, whatever zeros, you know, 1C, if you could go from New York to LA and so you go up to some altitude, turn something on and then turn it off and come down, that still might be pretty useful. And it's nothing compared to the speeds that we would be talking about when we look at a, another star system. So uh, maybe even, even terrestrially, the idea of a space warp could be something that might be useful in that context. It has nothing to do with, with space travel. It's just moving people or cargo from one destination to another that geographically on the Earth are kind of far away from one another. Right? So. Yeah, it'd be unbelievable. And when you were saying that, yeah, you just punch in obviously the information and what you're looking, how fast you're going to look to go, you would be able to use it on earth at some point. And, and that's why it was, because my ignorance, yeah, and this is not my area of expertise. No, it's okay. it's a good question. Right. But it was, you know, you always wonder because I would love to be able to, you know, get to yeah. here and then get to Japan in an hour. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you could live anywhere like new, in the world. New form right. of the subway, right? Just the, the, warp, right. the warp subway. <laughs> Right, exactly. So uh, the last thing I want to say is, uh, can you then give, can you give me then a little bit of an explanation on what solar sails are, and then just some other propulsion technology that you're working on as well? I know you've mentioned a few, but uh, just breaking them down a little bit for the listener and watcher who doesn't really understand maybe what these type of propulsion systems mm -hmm. are. Yeah, so a solar sail, uh, this is a, a concept where you have, uh, not unlike a wind sail, uh, but instead of using air molecules bouncing on a, a piece of cloth or a piece of nylon, uh, you have um, photons that bounce off of some kind of a silverized mylar or an ultralight material that's very, very reflective. Uh, and so solar sails, uh, you can imagine some large you know, sheet of silvery stuff that's in orbit somewhere and the sunlight uh, pushes on it. And so the sunlight generates the thrust, which makes that solar sail move. Uh, now in terms of um, uh, some interstellar uh, hopes and aspirations, our sister organization, Breakthrough Initiative, right, they, they have hopes of trying to do what's called a, a beamed energy sail, right, where it's a solar sail concept, but instead of relying on the sun to, to provide, you know, the limited amount of force that it can provide based on the, the amount of photons uh, that it, uh, it sends out and can reach a solar sail at you know, Earth, the distance from the Earth uh, to the Sun. Um, breakthrough initiatives would like to see a scenario where we have 10 to 100 gigawatts of lasers on the ground somewhere, uh, and then they they target uh, some kind of a solar sail that's about uh, five meters uh, by five meters, and uh, they can accelerate that solar sail in the span of about maybe eight to ten minutes and it will reach up to about 20% the speed of light uh, between oh. Earth and the moon. It accelerates that quickly. Uh, and then it might be able to get to Proxima Centauri in a, a pretty short period of time compared to Voyager 1, which will take, would take 70 some odd thousand years, right? So you, right. you've got a couple decades versus 70,000 years, it'll definitely take a couple decades, right? So, uh, so solar sails have kind of morphed into this whole approach of beamed energy propulsion. Uh, where you use ground power assets to, to beam uh, uh, a lot of photons at a sail to allow you to achieve uh, really high velocities. Um, some other propulsion things that we've worked on, certainly the work that we're doing internally, uh, we're doing some work with uh, you know, custom casimir cavities uh, and exploring some things that map to the frontiers of physics that may have some uh, implica te technology implications, very different from the idea of a space warp, but the understanding of the physics may, may one day lead to that. Um, you know, we've funded a number of teams that have worked on fusion propulsion. Uh, one of those I want to kind of lift up is an interesting approach by uh, uh, Setheon Yu at uh, Helicity Space. It is a fusion propulsion approach um, <clears throat> where it doesn't provide power to the spacecraft, number one. Number two, you actually have to provide it power. Now, folks might be saying, well, what value is that? Hold on, just, just listen for a second. So in the, in the fusion propulsion concept that uh, Helicity Space is working on, they have a physics coefficient of performance of five, right? So that's not enough to generate net power in an effective way, uh, net electric power in an effective way. But it is a great way to augment jet power because it's all thermal. 
So you could have a situation where you've got a, a thruster that still needs to be plugged in to a solar array, uh, and you give it 100 kilowatts of electrical power from the solar array. But because of the physics coefficient of performance being five, you get a lot more newtons per kilowatt than you would get if it were not a fusion propulsion system. So that, that Q of five of the fusion rocket gives you a lot more bang for the buck. Uh, so that may be an interesting near-term uh, idea where fusion may, uh, fusion may end up making its way onto orbit much sooner than, than any of us thought. So um, and then of course, in addition to that, we're, we, you know, I've talked about, we fund a couple of teams on space drives and traversable wormholes. And so I, I don't think there's a propulsion scheme we don't like, right? So. That's amazing. It's so exciting. It's so, so exciting. Uh, my last question too, where can people watch, inc- uh, where can people watch Go Incredibly Fast? So Go Incredibly Fast is on our YouTube website. I think if you Google Limitless Space Institute YouTube, you'll find our YouTube channel and it's, uh, it's, it's located there. I think you can also just Google Go Incredibly Fast. I think it comes up pretty quickly. So uh, I think you can watch it that way too. So Yeah, it made me, when I watched it last night, I got really yeah. excited. And I think yeah. that's what that video does. And it breaks it down really beautifully of, you know, different propulsion systems and then what you guys are working on now and kind of what that goal is and what that's going to look like in the future. So Sunny, thank you so much for joining me on Rebellious Curious, and hopefully I get to speak to you again soon. All right. Hey, thank you, Chrissy. I appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me and having me here. I enjoyed chatting with you. So. You as well. Thank you. Thank you.